Hi hey guys, Buildzoid here, and welcome to the 11th weekly Hardware Bot score roundup. Um, as is the norm, we've had a bunch of cool score. A bunch of cool scores have been uploaded to uh, Hardware Bot over the last week, and today we're going to be taking a look at quite a few of them. So let's get right into it. Starting off with Splave's uh, Quad Core Geekbench 3 world record. Um, so 31,517 points on a Ryzen 3 5300G doing 5.4 gigahertz on liquid nitrogen on a ASRock X570 Aqua motherboard. Uh, Splave is supported by ASRock, so he runs ASRock motherboard, uh, ASRock motherboards. And uh, with two sticks of single rank Samsung B, uh, two G skill Samsung B die. I, do I need to bother with like identifying memory sticks to the, this level of detail? I mean, when you see the memory timings, it becomes immediately obvious to anybody who knows what's going on with RAM that you're not running 4800 on anything. Like, you're not running 4800, 14, 14, 14 on anything other than Samsung B die. So. Kind of redundant to say, yeah, G-Skill Samsung beat I, I'm At the same time, I guess it's pretty obvious those are G-Skill DIMMs if you've ever seen a G-Skill Trident Z RGB kit. But anyway, um, yeah, uh, single rank, you know, Samsung beat I doing 4800, 14, 14, 14 with synchronized Infinity Fabric because the APU, like the 5300G, it's an APU, it's a monolithic die. So the Infinity Fabric doesn't have to go outside of the silicon ever. And the end result of that is that you can run really high Infinity Fabric clocks, which translates to a absolutely massive memory score of 11,608 11, points. Um, but what's interesting about the 5300G in Geekbench is that the 5300G has not much L3 cache. In fact, it has very little L3 cache. It only has 8 megabytes. I thought it had 16, so that really hurts. Um, and so it's on Zen 3, right? So it has more IPC than the previous uh, top CPU for quad-core Cinebench, which was the 3300X. Um, but you have much less L3 cache, right? The 3300X has, uh, well, twice as much L3 cache. And so the and also the 3300X, um, as far as I know, the problem with 5300Gs and getting them clocked really high is that they don't actually work properly at super low. Like, they don't go down to as low temperatures as the, say, 3000 series, like the, the CPUs. So the APUs can't go as cold as uh, the CPUs do. And with Ryzen, the, like, the most important thing for getting a high core clock is getting the chip as cold as possible. So due to the higher, like, so, so you've got this interesting situation of, like, the chip can't clock as high, it has way less L3 cache, um, but also has more IPC uh, and a much stronger memory system because it's monolithic compared to the 3300X, which has more core clock, less IPC, more L3 cache, worse memory, um, right? Like the, the thing is, this is desynchronized. So the uncore on like the, the FCLK is not going to be synced with the memory. So the memory performance, like you can just see it in the memory score. It's 9,106 points. It's way lower. Um, but interestingly enough, the floating point uh, test, right, in the benchmark is actually higher on the 5.7 gigahertz 3300X than it is on the 5.4 gigahertz 5300G. So the 5300G, like, we can see the IPC, you know, showing its strength because the chip, like, if the IPC was the same, the 5300G would be far behind. But the IPC is higher, so even at, you know, 300 megahertz uh, core clock less, the 5300G is capable of somewhat, ke like, keeping up with a 3300X in the uh, floating point test, um, even with the, you know, uh, like, the, the lack of L3 cache also isn't helping. Um, and, well, the small amount of, like, the smaller amount of L3 cache really isn't helping with that. But, uh, yeah, the IPC is enough to, to, to keep up. And then for the integer performance, it actually has an advantage. So I'm guessing the integer test just uh, either isn't as uh, cache intensive or that's where the IPC improvements of Zen 3 are more significant than on Zen 2 because, you know, like different instructions are going to see different performance gains going from one ar architecture to the next. Um, and then, of course, the memory performance on the 5300G is way higher. So this is this is an interesting sort of a uh, situation where, because the 5300G in, say, GPU Pi is just ridiculously fast compared to every other 
uh, CPU that like every other quad core CPU that's ever run GPU Pi. Um, but here in Geekbench 3, it's actually like because of the, the worst cold behavior and the low amount of L3 cache, it's actually sort of just barely inching past its 3300X predecessor. Um, so yeah, this, this is a really like, it, it's just interesting to see these, these differences between like, like, you know, the less clock, but still more score, but also like you do have that, that gap in the, in the floating points, like the, the floating point score here isn't great. So yeah, um, which is just, you know, what, what the CPU does. So that, that makes it kind of interesting in that, you know, uh, well, I guess there's still 5,300 Gs, assuming, like, m maybe there's 5,300 Gs that can clock significantly higher than this. The thing is, um, 5,300 Gs don't have a retail release, so they're really awkward to get for, for the purpose of overclocking, right? Um, so that really sucks that AMD has decided to just not sell 5,300 Gs because, uh, we haven't, like, it's been a while since we've had, well, the, the 3300X is a competitive quad-core, but the problem with the 3300X is finding one. Very similar to the 5300G in the sense that, hey, like, it's a great quad-core CPU, but you can't buy it. Um, now, the 5300G you can't buy because it's for OEMs, but the 3300X seems to just have very, very little to no supply. Um... So that's really unfortunate because AMD's making these really cool quad cores and they, they, then they don't want to sell them to anybody. Um, but yeah, nonetheless, um, great score from, from Splave here on the 5300G and congratulations to him on taking the uh, world record in quad core Geekbench 3. So let's move on to the next score, which is tags Ycruncher Pi 1 billion uh, second place in the triple core category using a Phenom 2 X2 565 Black Edition. Now, you might be looking at that X2 and thinking, is that not a dual-core CPU? Oh, well, it would be if AMD at the time had actually cared about properly disabling their silicon. So the funny thing about Phenom 2 X2s is that because AMD wasn't too bothered about properly disabling the, un like, the extra cores on these chips, uh, what you could do on a lot of motherboard, on a lot of AM3 and AM3 Plus motherboards, and actually still can do. You just have to buy a, you know, you buy a Phenom 2x2. You buy a AM3, AM3 Plus motherboard. You, you can still do this. It still works. Um, but yeah, like you, you get one of these CPUs, and you can just re-enable the cores. Like you can turn an X2 chip all the way into an X4 um, potentially. Now there is. Now, now, and this sounds great, except there are drawbacks to it, because a lot of the time the cores are disabled because they actually suck. Um, so I've had, like, Phenom 2 X2s where you enable the extra, you know, you enable the third core and the chip is no longer able to get into Windows because that third core is just completely unstable. Um, or I've had chips where, like, there are also chips that just don't enable extra cores whatsoever. Uh, then you have like, oh, you enable the third core, but the third core clocks like half a gigahertz worse than the rest of the CPU. So you you lose a bunch of frequency doing it. Um, so triple core uh, Phenom 2s are uh, like, aw like they're awkward, right? <laughs> Very odd, right? Odd core count, odd CPUs. Um, but, uh, and it, like, a fun category to, to get into, because Ph Phenom 2s are really fun to run, uh, at least if they're on a C3 stepping, they're very, very easy to run on LN2, um, though the triple core chips are kind of like, like, like you kind of have to get lucky, and, and, well, a lot of binning will go into the triple core ones, because, like, you're not even guaranteed to get a chip that'll actually have three functional cores, and then, w then when you start getting into the chips with three functional cores, it's like, well, some of them have three cores, but they don't run properly. And, you know, and then it's like, you need to get a triple core that is also like, A, has three cores, B, act is actually really good on all three cores. But, uh, yeah, anyway, so, so a very sort of weird CPU category. The only thing that's more odd than a triple core phenom, like a triple core, than triple core CPUs is the pentacore chips. 
because like the thing is triple core chips actually exist amd made 720 black editions and there's like a couple other phenom 2x3s that amd was selling and those are worse. If, if you're wondering why the, the top of the, the triple core rankings is like an X2560, an X2565, an X2570, an X2570, an X2555, and then finally you get an X3720, the reason for this is the, the X3720 Black Editions, as far as I know, were only ever made in a C1 stepping, and that stepping sucks on liquid nitrogen. It doesn't clock very high at all. It has a cold bug, which the later steppings don't even have at all, so you can run those at full pot. Uh, the clock speeds are atrocious, and so just generally, like, basically, yes, with an X2, you have to get lucky to get a chip that unlocks to three cores and is actually good, but if you actually get an X2 that unlocks to three cores and is halfway decent, it's going to be way better than, a nat like, a, a Phenom 2X3. Um, so that makes the triple core rankings kind of interesting like that. But then there's also the pentacore rankings where everybody has to run a 960, uh, I think it's the 960T. And that's like the only CPU that can do a, a pentacore configuration. Because I don't believe AMD actually sold pentacore chips. But yeah, um, here we're looking at triple core. And uh, TAG uh, here managed 7 minutes, 17 seconds, and 580 milliseconds running on a Crosshair 4 formula. He has a little postcard over there, which is pretty neat. Um, PCI postcard, so... Yeah, you can, like... That's one of the advantages of the old boards is that they have a PCI slots, and getting PCI, PCI postcards is much easier than, like, PCIe uh, postcode cards. Um... Yeah, CPU on LN2. For Y Cruncher, you also need a significant, like, quite a lot of memory, which for DDR3, like, all of the good DDR3 is relatively low density, and then the Phenom 2 memory controllers are, well, they get worse as they get colder. Um, almost universal. Like, for most chips, the colder you run them, the, the worse the memory overclocking gets. Kind of like Ryzen, but not quite so bad. Um... Well, actually, Ryzen's different. Ryzen, the memory controller, actually, like, the the memory controller's fine. It's the Infinity Fabric that has a problem with it. So, on Phenom 2's, the memory controller itself has a problem with it. And then the North Bridge, which is, uh, actually scales great with liquid nitrogen. Um, but yeah, so, almost 5.8 gigahertz on all three cores on this CPU. Um, 3.2 gigahertz on the North Bridge. And uh, memory doing 1672, um, 888, 24 timings. For, so, like, the memory settings here by DDR3 standards, or even by Phenom 2 standards, they're not really that amazing, but you have to consider the risk limitations of Y-Cruncher. Also, Y-Cruncher is incredibly, like, sensitive to stability. Um, also, this thing is running for seven minutes, you know, seven minutes of an all-core workload, this is basically, like, this is approaching stress test territory, um, right, with with the combination of how long it's running and also just how heavy Y-Cruncher tends to be, though uh, probably not that bad on a Phenom 2 just because Phenom 2s don't have AVX support or AVX, like, they just don't do AVX instructions, so, yeah, but that just makes the benchmark run even longer, so... Yeah, an interesting score, and of course a very like a good, a great score, right? Second place on a in the, in the triple core Y Cruncher Pi one billions, uh, one billion rankings. Um, yeah, running on the the Crosshair Four formula with some crucial memory apparently. Um, but those are really that's actually that's there's some really interesting Micron DDR three memory chips out there. Like, I have a set of Micron DDR3 that just does the weirdest timings I've ever seen. Um, I should do a video on that someday. Um, but yeah, this this looks like actually basically a, a slight up, like a slight bump to the XMP of this memory kit. Which, you know, again, for, for you know, Y Cruncher stability might actually be the limit. Because um, it is a very, very heavy benchmark. So... Congratulations to Tag on the second place in Y Cruncher Pi 1 billion uh, triple core uh, in the Y Cruncher Pi 1 billion triple core rankings, and let's move on to the next score, which is RM 3113's uh, fourth. 
I'm, I think it sounds cooler if we just say first place for dual 1080 Ti's, but technically also fourth place in Fire Strike uh, with, uh, with a dual GPU setup. Um, so, yeah, first place on dual 1080 Ti's, and, like, it should become, be obvious how this got into the roundup. This, this, three LN2 pots, of course it gets into the roundup. So, CPU on LN2, both GPUs on LN2, uh, 1080 Ti's are quite fiddly to run on liquid nitrogen, I'm mostly in the sense that the thermal paste likes to fail. Um, so getting all three, like, like getting all both cards down to, I'm, well, depends if these cards actually run at full pot, because that's another uh, issue with 1080 Ti's, is some of the cards will have a cold bug at around, like, well, we'll just have a cold bug somewhere between, like, minus 80 and, uh, well, full pot. Um, and then there's some cards which you can just sort of take all the way down to full pot without worrying about it. Um, so I don't know about the, these two these two specific cards right here, but even then it's like if you do have full pot cards, you do run into the issue of like the thermal paste likes to not stay attached properly because 1080 Ti's can pull quite a lot of power when, when they're on liquid nitrogen. Um, and also the chip is relatively big, so... Yeah, the the ther like the stre like the the thermal like the thermal loading and the thermal density means that the the thermal paste gets quite a workout and it's very easy to basically lose thermal contact which you need to then heat back up and then cool the card back down and sometimes that doesn't actually fix the problem so then you need to you know warm the system all the way back up take it apart redo redo your thermal paste and put it back together see if it so Running running 1080 Ti's on LN2 is already somewhat fit, like somewhat difficult to do. Running two of them is that much harder. Then you add into the mix a 5950X, and you know th this setup looks like a real workout. Now, admittedly, like luckily Firestrike the the physics test is not super hard on the CPU, so you don't have to worry about that too much. And also uh, that looks like a Kingpin cooling F1 Dragon uh, LN2 pot. I think it's the F1 Dragon or F1 Dark. I'm I think no F1 Dark. I'm thinking of a different one. Uh, screwed up the names. No, so that was probably an F1 Dark, which is one of the heaviest LN2 pots that I'm aware of. Um, and the reason that's significant is very heavy LN2 pots um, are very slow to change temperature because they have a lot of mass, right? A lot, lot of thermal capacity. Um, and so, if you're trying to keep the temperature steady uh, with a really heavy LN2 pot, that's somewhat easier. But with the uh, multi-GPU setups, you run into the issue of, like, you can't, you usually can't run very heavy, like, very large GPU pots because you need to fit both GPUs onto the, into the same system. So you usually end up running lighter LN2 pots that are actually harder to control temperature-wise just in order to get all the cards to fit. Um... So yeah, this this is a very fiddly setup to run, and uh, we don't have motherboard details, which is a shame. I wonder if we can. That looks that's a crosshair something like that. That's a crosshair heatsink over there. I don't know if it's a dark hero or if it's a regular crosshair hero. It's not a formula. The formula has water cooling, but yeah, that that looks very crosshair. Yeah, it's a dark hero. Okay, so we do have it. It's the screenshot. I could have just clicked on that. Um, yeah, 2400 megahertz on the core on the, the 1080 Ti's with, uh, four, looks like he's running them desynced on the, yeah, one of them's running 1476 memory, the other one's running 1440. Also looks like the core clocks aren't matched, though that might just be down to the, that might, yeah, that actually might just be from the, the relative stock clocks and then how boost behaves. I don't run a lot of SLI. In fact, I just don't run a lot of NVIDIA GPUs in general, so I'm not sure how that works out. That might be normal. If you saw something like that on an AMD setup that you, like, on AMD, you can actually run completely desynchronized GPU clocks, um, which is horrible for frame pacing, but gives you more frames, so who cares? Um, but, uh... Yeah, so I'm, I'm guessing the cores are actually synchronized. And the memory, I believe you can actually run desynced on NVIDIA GPUs. It's just the cores that have to be synced. Um, yeah, 5950X doing 5.3 gigahertz on, on, on LN2. And 
Yeah, fastest, you know, dual 1080 Ti run ever in Fire Strike. Heavily helped by the 5950X. Like, the, the 5950X and just the physics scores and the combined scores it produces are absolutely insane. So, for comparison here, we have a, like, previous top score for dual 1080 Ti's. And you can see, this is a this is a 7980XE doing 5.8 gigahertz and... You know, it's it's not keeping up with the 5950X in the physics test, and it's not even, like, and the same is true for combined. It's way behind on combined, way behind on physics. Um, higher GPU score, because I believe these cards are running, yeah, these, these are doing 2500. Um, but, uh, yeah, still a very, very, like, you know, so so this score, you, you could argue, kind of getting car carried by the 5950X, but this is still... Yeah, like this is this is still pushing the cards really really hard. Like 1080 Ti's getting them up to up to 2400 isn't exactly super easy and it's less so when you have two of them and a CPU to worry about. So yeah, uh, a very very solid score and honestly this this is something I should actually do. Like th this scored like well, one of the points of the Hardware Bot score roundups is to sort of, like, in inspire other people to bench, and also me. Me, because I, I don't bench it anywhere near enough. Um, and th lo looking at this, I'm like, well, I've got a 5950X, and I have multiple 1080 Ti's, so this is something I should totally try to do. I, I also have enough LN2 pots to do this. Um, and I have... And it would be a good test for Cryonaut uh, Extreme, I guess, to see if see if it holds up because the old like on well the last time i ran a 1080 ti like the thermal paste was was a nightmare that 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 was the the first time i came up with the idea of just gluing a thermocouple to the back of the gpu core so i don't have to sit there wondering has the th thermal paste given up or like am i just doing something wrong um because yeah, on on 1080 Ti's, that's a very that, that's a major problem you run into where it's just like the 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 thermal paste just disconnects from the either the I, I'm pretty sure it usually disconnects from the actual silicon, and then your thermal transfer is just terrible, um, and you, you can't run any you can't run any benchmarks anymore. Also, uh, there's um, yeah, 1080 Ti's are cool to run. So th this is something that I'm like. Yeah, I should do this. I, I should totally do this once I clear out some of my other benchmarking backlog. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this is this is an awesome score. Congratulations to RM3113 on, you know, first place in 1080 Ti, dual 1080 Ti Fire Strike, and then fourth place in Fire Strike in general. The, the, admittedly, the, the, the thing is, like, Firestrike is getting to the point where it's, like, very much CPU limited, right? Like, we have the 2080 Ti's barely, barely producing more, high, like, barely producing higher scores than the, the 1080 Ti over here. Actually, I want to, I want to check that, check what CPU was used for this. 9980XE. I wonder if you might not be better off running, like, a 10900K to boost the, like... Because the X299 chips are almost certainly hurting the GPU score. Um, actually, maybe even a 5950X would give you more GPU score than a 9980XE. Because the, the X299 chips, the mesh is like... It, it's really bad for, <laughs> for single core performance. So, yeah. Anyway... Let's move on to the next score, which is another score from TAG, and this time it's W Prime 32M on the E5200, um, fastest E5200 to ever run W Prime 32M over here. 12 seconds, 293 milliseconds. W Prime 32M is a benchmark I do rather like, mostly because it finishes very, very quickly. Though it is a benchmark that you do have to run it on Windows XP or. Like, th this is one of those, be like, old benchmarks that there's a bunch of software things that go into making it run properly. Um, interestingly enough, it doesn't care very much about memory settings, which is why we're just looking at DDR3, what is that, 1400 and, like, 50-ish, doing 676 on the memory, so... Yeah, that's, you know, by, by DDR3 memory standards, that's not exactly any anything super crazy over there. 
but the CPU itself is doing 6.065 gigahertz. And that, I believe, like this is W prime, so I bet it's the fastest clocked E5200 ever by three megahertz. Um, I wonder what the difference is there. So, and this is a very competitive ranking. Like the third place is from 2019. Uh, second, like the second place is from 2017, right? So this this is a very very popular CPU. Um, I I don't know anything about E5200s. I just know it goes into LGA775. So like, or more like that, it's a like that it fits the LGA775 socket. Um, but yeah, W Prime is a, a pretty straightforward multi-core CPU benchmark more frequent more cpu frequency equals more better and then there's some stuff the, that then there's some operating system stuff that you can do to 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 get it to run faster like running it on like windows 10 you're probably not going to get anywhere with it um especially on an older platform like lga 7775 uh, now for the motherboard it's a Rampage, uh, Asus Rampage Extreme, which is probably the most popular LGA 775 uh, motherboard for competitive overclocking. Um, there's quite a few modif- like, well, I don't know that I would consider the removal of the jet, like the Fujitsu capacitors that- so these boards are kind of notorious for having a bunch of Fujitsu sort of prodlizer type capacitors um, that like to fail short circuit. Um, so it's very common that a lot of these, like a lot of Rampage Extremes these days that people are running on hardware bot probably have capacitor replacements on them just because those Fujitsu capacitors fail so much. But I don't know that I would consider that, well, I guess it's a modification, right? A repair modification, kind of similar thing. Um, and then there's some other voltage modifications that occasionally get done to these boards to, to enhance the overclocking range. Um... But uh, I don't know the specifics on them because while, like, when I see an interesting discussion about LGA 775, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to read it. I don't remember much of it because I'm ne I, I have no plans to run LGA 775 myself. I have far too much hardware as is. The last thing I need to do is get into a platform where you need to bin motherboards and you can buy CPUs by the bucket. <laughs> Which is one of the main appeals of LGA 775 is just the CPUs are incredibly cheap a lot of the time. So you can like, and there's just a massive variety of CPUs that you can run on the socket as well. Like you can have like, you can have one good 775 motherboard and run, I don't even know how many CPUs through it. Because literally everything that fits into the socket is overclockable. Um, some chips more so than others. And... All of them, and at this point, basically all of them are incredibly cheap. So a very, very popular platform, very competitive rankings in a lot of the benchmarks for a lot of the CPUs. Um, and yeah, so, you know, get, getting first place in something like W Prime 32M, I mean, we, like, we went through the scores, like, you know, we, the, the most, re like, most recent high score submission to this ranking is, already, is from, uh, from 2019. So, for, for like, I, I don't even know what the CPU is. I consider it kind of, um, but yeah, very competitive ranking. So, as, as, unfortunately, I just don't know that much about 775. So, it's like, I don't know if E5200s were particularly popular. It's a dual core. I, I don't even know when the CPU was released. Um, it has very few instruction sets supported. Um, but, um. Yeah, still a, you know, like, it's first place in a very competitive ranking. So a solid score, and congratulations to Tag on the W uh, W Prime 32M top score for the E5200. Let's move on to the next score, which is Noxinite's Cinebench R15, third place with the Core i5-4670K, doing 6 GHz on liquid nitrogen using an ASRock Z97OC formula, uh, which many consider to be the best uh, Z90... Well, actually, I think the best LGA1150 motherboard ever made for, for overclocking. Um, that's a unique insulation style. That kind of looks like it might just be some kind of putty. Like, I'm not sure that's even... Like, a lot of people will use artist... Uh, like, some kind of eraser. That might be... Actually, yeah, it might be artist's eraser. 
but that's normally grey, not white. So, anyway, interesting insulation over there. Um, and Haswell chips, uh, they don't clock very high. Uh, they have a cold bug, usually between minus 100 and minus... I th I've heard of chips go down to minus 40, My, like a minus 140, I, I should say, not minus 40. Minus, minus 40 would be terrible. Um, that's like Sandy Bridge territory. But, yeah, from like minus, uh, minus 100 down to minus 140. And the thing is, that really limits the kinds of clocks that are, that are possible to run on, on Haswell CPUs. So, 6 gigahertz is actually, like, that's a high frequency for a, especially for a 4670K. Like, 4770Ks would clock significantly higher, pretty consistently. But when it comes to 4670Ks... Yeah, not many of them doing more than more than six gigahertz, right? Um, and so, just getting the chip to six gigahertz is already a already an achievement there. And then also like great efficiency, right? Like six gigahertz beating a score that's running six point one. Um, really, like actually insanely close to a to a score running a CPU that's like clocked two hundred and fifty megahertz higher. And the cool thing about this score, actually, is the memory being used. So you'll notice this is DDR3, like, uncore frequency is, you know, 5.7 gigahertz, so that's a very high uncore. But then also the memory settings here are just, like, DDR3 2800, 8, 12, 13, 15, one T command rate with also a TRC of, a TRFC of 96 uh, clocks is insane to say like 96 clock trfc compared to like the best ddr4 where, where you'd at, well maybe in this frequency range you'd be looking at closer to no you'd still be looking at well over 100 on even the very best ddr4 memory sticks in this frequency range um but uh yeah so the the cool thing about this th these memory like th th so first of all just ddr3 2800 uh you know cl8 is that that's kind of that's up there for for ddr3 like that's for cl8 that's about as high as it gets for the frequency um but the crazy thing is those are oem memory sticks see those green pcbs and the lack of heat spreaders also notice how it's just being cooled by a fan um because the memory that noxinite here is running is actually samsung g die which is a one gigabit um and he's running dual rank samsung g die here but that is a g one gigabit memory chip, and it was a relatively late production one gigabit memory chip, so it never, like, none of the big memory uh, vendors, like G-Skill or Corsair, ever really did anything with it, even though it has these crazy overclocking capabilities, because by the time this stuff was released, making a memory kit that was like, you know, four gigs of RAM, would just, nobody wants to buy that. Right, like people who were buying Haswell systems or buying systems at the time that GDI started being produced, didn't want to buy four gig memory kits, just because like that's not a practical size of a memory kit, right? Like the most you can get on a dual channel platform with GDI is eight gigs of memory because it's one gigabit. So with four sticks, you would only have eight gigs of RAM, and so basically the only memory sticks you can get GDI on are like. OEM memory sticks, um, but even then with like, and the thing is the OEM PCBs are generally built to be as just cheap as possible, the absolute bare minimum to make a functional memory stick, but yeah, GDI, the, the, the memory chip itself is just so freaking strong that, you know, DDR3 2800, 8, 12, 13, 15, yep, that, that works, and it works on air cooling. No, no liquid nitrogen needed, though, funnily enough, uh, that's actually also true of the like, there is Samsung D-Die, I believe, 2 gigabit, which was actually popular with the various uh, memory manufacturers like G-Skill and Corsair, because that was a reasonable memory capacity, right? Like, you could sell a 2x8 kit, and that's, that's like, a usable amount of RAM at the time that it was relevant. This stuff, on the other hand, freaking wasn't. So we never got any really cool, like, you, you never saw any, like, crazy high-bin G-Die kits. Um, but, yeah, even D-Die actually doesn't really... Uh, do doesn't really benefit from anything more than just air cooling. So that's not that weird. Like, it's not that weird that, like, 
Sam Samsung G die and Samsung D die both have similar sort of thermal behavior, but um, actually, in the Samsung memory chips in general don't seem to particularly care too much for being very cold. Um, but uh, yeah, like a, a really cool score just because crazy efficiency and then just really cool memory. Like the, the it, like it's just really cool to see this sort of obscure, like, arguably obscure, well, I don't know that it's obscure, if you're into competitive overclocking enough, you should have probably heard of Samsung G die at this point, um, but, uh, relatively obscure memory kit, like, re well, re pretty obscure memory chip, right, because, like, it never made it into any, like, DDR3 2600 kits or something, which it would do very easily, it's just that nobody would buy 2 gig DDR3 2600 memory sticks. <laughs> so nobody ever made them, which is a bit of a shame. Um, so yeah, you're, you're kind of stuck. Like, if you wanted to get GDI, you're, you're kind of stuck buying, like, OEM sticks that are rated for, I think, 1600 CL9. So, yeah, just basic JDEC and... Um, but that, that, that doesn't, that doesn't stop those sticks from producing, you know, doing crazy overclocks and producing massive Cinebench R15 scores. So, congratulations to Noxonite on, on managing the third place with the 4670K. And also just running a very, like, I, I think this is like the first, one of the first scores I've seen with like, you know, GDI really being taken advantage of, I guess, is, is the best way to put it. Because I'd say there's a big part of this score is just, like, the memory settings here, right? Because, yeah, you know, there's some things you can do to the, the OS to get Cinebench R15 to run faster. But um, on Haswell chips, um, you know, it comes down a lot to uncore. Like, if you're limited on core frequency, it's just, like, how far can you push the uncore? How far can you push the memory? And so so the GDI is certainly uh, contributing here quite a bit. Um and congratulations to Noxonite on the Cinebench R15 third place. Let's move on to the next score, which is Salty Croissant's uh, fourth place on the HD5970 uh, in 3D Mark Vantage performance. We've got quite the rainbow of a system here. Uh, looks like chilled water cooling. Yeah, I'm guessing chilled water cooling, because otherwise, why would you wrap your tubing and water blocks in, in paper towels? Um, Vault mods on the card looks like just V core. I'm, yeah, I'm only seeing two potentiometers, so that's going to be just V core because uh, dual. Well, actually, if you go to really old dual core cards, those would run a single V core VRM for both cores, which at some point somebody came to the conclusion that that's a little bit suboptimal in terms of power delivery. So we started having two VRMs for the two cores. Um, but yeah, so two V-Core mods, doesn't look like any memory voltage mod, uh, like, no, doesn't look like there's a v, uh, memory voltage mod. Um, and here we can see the, uh, well, insulation for the chilled water cooling. So that's a nice VRM heatsink he has there, and then that VRM... Oh, wait, that's that VR, like, isn't that VRM backwards? Like, th this one, I think, is... The, like, the layout on that VRM is really weird. Like, normally you'd expect the inductors to be towards the GPU core, but if I'm not mistaken on this card, the MOSFETs are actually, like, this metal plate is actually cooling the MOSFETs, which is super weird, because if you looked at, like, a 7990 or a 6990, um, the MOSFETs would actually be on the top edge of the card, not towards the, not towards the PLX chip, which is hanging out somewhere in the middle there. Um, but, uh... Yeah, so, you know, car heavily modified card here, <laughs> right? We, well, I don't know. Well, we've got some vault mods, and then the, the cooling modifications, I guess, you, you could consider heavy. Um, and then for the actual score, 5900X doing 4.823 gigahertz at 1.3... Uh, I'm going to guess that's 1.4 volts with some V-droop on it. 12 cores, 12 threads, because 3D Mark Vantage does not scale above 16 threads and slows down significantly if you give it too many threads. So, yeah, you, you don't want to run it with, with uh, more than 12 cores. And Well, if you, if you have a 5900X, you want to disable the SMT. If you have a 5950X, really want to disable the SMT. Memory doing 3933, 14, 14, 14, 30. Um, GPU cores doing 1080 and the memory doing 1300 megahertz. Um, 
yeah, re like, unfortunately, the thing is, I think for 5000 series, that's actually quite high on the core frequency there. Like, I've run a little bit of 5000 series, but it's only been like 5870s, and I think my 5870s, like, the, the cards don't really scale with voltage, if I remember correctly. Like, you could shove a lot of voltage into them, and nothing would happen. Um, which was very frustrating. It's like, I have all this cool, like, because the thing is, these don't pull that much power. Um, so they're relatively easy to cool. So, you know, at ambient, you go like, oh, yeah, I'm going to shove so much voltage in these. It's going to be great. And then nothing happens. And apparently, even with chilled water cooling, that doesn't really change. So, um, yeah. But still, a very, very solid score, right? Fourth place. Um, obviously, with, with 3D Mark Vantage and that 5900X, that 5900X is significantly boosting the overall score. But everybody does that when they run their 3D Mark Vantage. Um, like, we have this lovely score with a, you know, 5970, which is actually running... Is that a worse GPU score? Yeah, slightly worse, G you know, slightly worse GPU score, but 9980XE 9980XE at 5 gigahertz, that CPU score just kind of carries the card to to first place. Um, which I bet Salty Croissant is very salty about that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's, that's unfortunately a reality of a lot of these older GPU rankings, is just every time a new, better CPU gets released... Every, a lot of people will just go back and revisit their favorite cards with their new best CPU. Um, which, um, yeah. Shaggy SVK, I'm not sure if he has a 5950X, but there's other people who have 5950Xs and 5970s, like yours truly. I actually have a 5970. I need to do something with it. Probably run Vantage on it. Um, but, um... Yeah, may maybe I won't run all 16 cores, just just to... Eh, nah, I'll, I'll run 16 cores. Like, I could have... Fr I, I could maybe make first place with that, assuming I can get the card clocked high enough. But still, Salty Croissant, uh, you know, great, like, great GPU overclock here. Um, great to see, you know, the mods and the cooling uh, and the rainbow adds FPS. <laughs> totally works like that. So congratulations to him on fourth place with the 5970 in 3D Mark Vantage performance. Let's move on to the next score, which is Ground's reference frequency top score for the Rampage 2 Extreme um, of 300 megahertz. So that is a 300 megahertz BCLK overclock on the Rampage 2 Extreme. Uh, and this was a long, like, th this was a massive effort getting this score. Like, I've talk talked to Ground about this. Uh, apparently, you know, he's been waiting several years to get this score. Um, and then the CPU died very, very shortly after he got the got this score. Apparently due to condensation buildup on the motherboard, uh, VRM shorted out, killed the CPU. So... Is not going to be revisiting this anytime soon, I guess. Um, probably doesn't have to, as, uh, yeah, there's, like, inched past <laughs> the previous record. Which isn't actually that old either. Yeah, the previous record is also from, 20, uh, is from 2020. Um, but uh, the thing is, this is actually the high, I believe this is the highest BCLK on X58 in general. Yeah. Yeah, literally the highest BCLK frequency to be ever, to be done on any X58 motherboard. Um, is this restricted? Yeah, on any X58 motherboard. So, you know, this, this is a, like, crazy score. Like, nobody, like, there's, there's exactly, uh, one other score that's, that's over 300 megahertz, and, uh, yeah, ground, ground beat that one. Um, so... Just an insane score uh, in terms of just what it is. And then, unfortunately, the, the CPU died. And for, for reference frequency, you'd, you know, you run as few memory sticks as possible. Um, what GPU is... Oh, it looks like the GPU is hanging off a riser. <laughs> I'm like, it's the GPU. Uh, it's over there. Um, 
We've got a fan for cooling the North Bridge on the motherboard, LN2 on the CPU. And this was in, uh, with, on, from a, like, th this was a, Ground did this score with, in a bench session with Shaggy SVK, who's also posted a bunch of scores that we're going to get to very, very soon. But yeah, so this right here is just, like, the BCLK record for, for X58. Um, and a massive score, um, or, well, massive frequency for, 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 for the X58 chipset. Should I say IOH? Because technically, well, I know, chipset, because you have the set of chips. So that, that makes it a chipset. Arguably, what we refer to as a chipset these days is less of a chipset than what you have on X58, because there's just one chip now instead of two of them. Um, but yeah, massive, massive VCLK frequency. Um, and, and Ground, like, knows so much about X58. Um, he, like, the, <laughs> the only platform he runs. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. So, ev just just a massive, massive memory, well, massive uh, BCLK frequency there. And congratulations to him on, uh, I guess, finally getting getting this frequency that, that he, he wanted so much. And it's a real shame the CPU up and died, because it might have had more in it. Um, but... It's unlikely that we'll see this score go down anytime soon. So anyway, let's move on to the next score, which is Noisemaker's 3D Mark 06, top score for the GTX 770. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the 3D Mark 06, one of those old benchmarks that's very much a CPU benchmark these days. So yes, the, seven, the 770 is moving, right? 1345 on the core, 1900 on the memory. Um, which is a, you know, like, but you're not doing that on stock voltage. Let's put it that way. Um, so, yeah. And that's a lightning. That's cool. Um, so, you know, G GPU, it's not like the GPU is just running at stock, but uh, the CPU is definitely the star of the show here, doing 6.6 .6 gigahertz on an 11900K, 8 cores, 8 threads, memory doing 3866, 12, 11, 11, 18, uh, so gear one, uh, gear one memory, uh, mode. So memory controller synced with the memory frequency, which gives you better memory latency than running desynced. However, I'm not actually like, the, I'm not sure that this is necessarily the be best way to run 3D Mark 06. And the reason I'm saying that is because, uh, yeah, Noisemaker himself is just like, I was trying gear one. I don't know if it's better, <laughs> but, uh, still. You know, top score for the GTX 770, um, 11900K running 6.6 .6 gigahertz, like, it's quite quite a, like, the, the thing is, the 11th gen chips actually generally clock worse than the 10th gen chips, because the cores are so much bigger that, well, they don't clock as high. Um, so, um, 6 point, you know, 6.6 6 6 gigahertz, 8 cores, 8 threads, because I believe 3D Mark 06 actually has a, like, a pretty heavily multi-threaded CPU test, which is why you would actually be running 8 cores, because for a lot of the even older 3D Marks, you would be running, like, 4 cores or even 3 cores, um, because any extra, like, any cores you don't need, let's just throw them out. You can do more, higher frequencies with less cores. Um, so... Uh, yeah, a very, you know, ver very solid score right here for the GTX 770, um, beating AKM, who actually, I believe, did the exact same thing with, yeah, also a 6.6 .6 gigahertz 11900K, but different approach to the memory setting, so that is interesting. However, uh, AKM was running that, like, there are 770s out there that will hit 1241 at stock settings, and I'm pretty sure this is one of them. Is this not a lightning? Yeah, that's a lightning. I'm pretty sure that ru runs runs that clock basically out of the box. Um, so, uh, yeah, well, that that's what you get for for not... <laughs> oh, like, no, it's actually literally stock, because 1150, 1150. Yeah, see, that's what you get for not overclocking your GPU in what is not... Act like, 3D Mark 06 might be old enough that you need an 11900K at 6.6 .6 gigahertz to get the top score in it, but it's not so old that you just get to not, you know, overclock your GPU at all. So, yeah, congratulations to, to Noisemaker on, on uh, the, the top score with, uh, in 3D Mark 06 with the GTX 770. 
And let's move on to the next score, which is Warper's Cinebench R15 on the Core i5-2500K. And this is a fourth place in the 2500K rankings, uh, doing 5.8 gigahertz on liquid nitrogen. And Sandy Bridge on liquid nitrogen is uh, very weird, because Sandy Bridge has an insanely warm cold bug. A lot of the Sandy Bridge chips will not work properly at like, well, some of them won't work properly even at minus 20 degrees. Uh, a lot of them will have a sweet spot somewhere around minus 50. Um, so in fact, you can't even properly run Sandy Bridge on dry ice. Um, and arguably, like, actually, let's just check out the, the, the 2500K rankings. Yeah, you, you'll notice that like not very, very many people choose to run dry ice on a, on a CPU that actually has a very warm cold bug like that. Right, which a lot of the time it's like if you want an easy benching session, you just run dry ice because on, on under most circumstances, dry ice isn't cold enough to trigger cold bugs on most hardware. Sandy Bridge is the exception. Sandy Bridge will cold bug so, so like at such high temperatures that dry ice is actually too cold. And because of how dry ice uh, is like when, when you run dry ice, you're not running just dry ice in the LN2 pot. You need to run an interface fluid. And because of that, you can't really get proper temperature control like you can do, like you can with LN2, because with dry ice, you basically have a soup of dry ice and some kind of interface fluid, and you don't actually want to have a soup. But the, the thing is, because you need that interface fluid, and because dry ice is a solid, regulating the temperature with dry ice is insanely hard. Um, like, dry ice is great when your goal is to just sit at minus 70 degrees to the best of your ability. But if your goal is to be at minus 50 degrees, um, you're much better off with LN2. Because with LN2, you can drip feed the, the LN2 pot and, you know, it'll boil away and you're left with an L empty LN2 pot. And you can just rely on the uh, mass of the LN2 pot to keep bringing the temperature down. With dry ice, um, you know, you're it's a solid. <laughs> You can't just drip feed it in and hope that you don't overshoot it like you can with LN2. Um, and so that makes Sandy Bridge a very sort of weird platform where it's like you see a lot of LN2, you see a lot of, uh, you know, single stage phase change systems. Uh, you don't see much in the way of dry ice because dry ice is too cold for, for, for Sandy Bridge CPUs. As a side effect of that, Sandy Bridge chips also don't clock super high compared to like water cooling because they don't work at really low temperatures, right? Like if we if we look here, uh, even with like with water cooling, you're actually assuming you have an incredibly good 2500K, you can get into the top 20 of 2500K Cinebench scores on water cooling. Um, and that's again, just down to the fact that like Sandy Bridge doesn't really run very well at super low temperatures. So getting 5.8 gigahertz on a 2500K is very difficult. And, you know, you need to be on top of the temperature control because Sandy Bridge things. Um, anyway, other than that, Sandy Bridge's DD, like memory controller by DDR3 standards is also nothing spectacular. So here we're just looking at, uh, what is that, 2160? No, that's like 2170, isn't it? Oh, uh, he didn't... Oh, well. So, yeah, 21... Tw like, 2177, 10.7. Uh, the thing is, with Sandy Bridge, you actually have a very limited range of uh, memory ratios. You can only go up to times 20... Uh, 20 up to the 2133 ratio. Um, and, yeah, and that's that's kind of it. And the thing is, the problem with that is, like, so you can only go up to 2133, and there's not a lot of BCLK overclocking range, because Sandy Bridge is one of those platforms where BCLK overclocks absolutely everything, and so everything just starts getting unstable, um, and that makes, you know, uh, Sandy, like, San is just, Sandy Bridge is a weird platform to run Sub-Zero, very fiddly, um... And, uh, yeah, so th this right here is a, is a very solid score with, you know, 5.8 gigahertz, 1.7 volts. The crazy thing is, is if you're benching Sandy Bridge on water cooling, you can actually, like, it'll scale up to 7 volt, 1.7. It'll maybe randomly up and die on you if you do that, but it will scale. Um, 
and I'm speaking from experience as somebody who ran a uh, what was it? I think I ran 1.725. Well, I'm speaking about the scaling from experience. I've not had a Sandy Bridge die on me yet, but yeah, I've I've run Sandy Bridge at 1.725 volts for benchmarks because it just kept scaling, which. Yeah, and then on LN2, like, the crazy thing is, like, on LN2, you're still going to be running similar voltages because you can't actually go that cold even compared to water cooling. Um, so, yeah, but also a very, very competitive ranking, a very fiddly CPU architecture to just run sub-zero at all. And so, an impressive score from Warper here. Uh, and congratulations to him on 4th place in the 2500k Cinebench R15 rankings. Anyway, let's move on to the next score, which is Shaggy SVK's 3D Mark 3 with the GTX 1060 6 gig, uh, with, a, with a GTX 1060 6 gig card. Uh, 25,000, uh, wait, no, uh, 20, 259,059 points. Um, 3D Mark 03, being an old 3D Mark, spits out absolutely massive scores. And this is done with a 11900K on phase change, doing just uh, just over 5.9 gigahertz. Yeah, so of the actually, where, where, where's the phase change? Oh, the well, you can't really see the phase change in. Well, you can kind of see it over there, right? Well, you can see the tube for the phase change system, but uh. Yeah, 1060 on an e-power. Um, I believe the stock, apparently the stock VRM was a, th yeah, actually we can see the inductors. This was a three-phase uh, V-Core VRM. Um, so, you know, you, you don't really want to be doing extreme overclocking on a three-phase. So give the card a 12-phase, much better. <laughs> so that's exactly what, what Shaggy SVK did here. Um, so that's an, e that's an EVGA ePower 5, that's a 12 phase uh, VR, like it's basically a standalone 12 plus 2 flip phase VRM. Um, you desolder the, uh, like a lot, you desolder a bunch of the exist, like stock VRM components that the card comes with, and then you whack this on instead. Now it's a bit more complicated than that because when you desolder the VRM of the, the card, the card, mo most cards get very upset when you screw with their power delivery like that. Uh, AMD cards more so than NVIDIA cards. NVIDIA cards are still relatively easy to, to get them to work again, like, get them to work with e-powers. AMD cards, on the other hand, are an absolute freaking nightmare. Um, but yeah, um, you replace the VRM, and then you take the card on liquid nitrogen, as we can see here, uh, shove 1.35 volts into the core, and it does 24-17. And that, that's how, how you overclock a GTX 1060 uh, <laughs> properly. Hardcore. <laughs> so, yeah. And then, of course, the 11900... Like, 3D Mark 3 is an old benchmark. But 3D Mark 3 is, is interesting out of the old 3D Marks because it does scale a lot with GPU clock, right? Like, the, that 2400 uh, core clock, like, 2400 core clock there, it's not just for show. Um, right? Now, obviously, the twenty uh, the eleven nine hundred K is helping a lot, as uh, you know the the second place score is on a twenty six seventy core card. But um, yeah, the the thing is, like, one, this card is on an e power. Two, this card actually has a relatively high cold bug. Yeah, which is really unfortunate. Minus minus eighty on Pascal is is a really unfortunate cold bug, because a lot of Pascal chips you can run them all the way down to full pot. Um, and at that point, you, you know, with a 1060, maybe 2600 core would have been possible if, if the car actually worked at temperatures that low, which, yeah, uh, unfortunately you, you just don't know, as far as I know, like there's not really a workaround for Pascal cards because the thing that causes that issue is that the, the temperature sensor bugs out when it gets too cold. Um, and on some cards it bugs out and well actually it bugs out on all cards But on some cards it bugs out in such a way that they stop working Whereas other cards it bugs out and you just get a broken temperature reading, which is fine. You could still run the card anyway um, you're, Like that's what we have the k-type thermo couples for but uh, Yeah, so really unfortunate with the cold bug there, but still a very very solid score um, And just cool to see you know a, a, an e-power card running just because this is this is about as modified as it gets, right? Like, 
when the when the stock VRM is so bad that instead of just like you know maybe adding like vault you know getting extra like vault modding it for extra voltage control or you know maybe even adding some capacitors to improve the filtering when the stock VRM is so bad that you just replace the whole damn thing um, that 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 is about as uh, ex like intense modifications as it gets for 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 vault molds. Um, and yeah, this is really difficult to do because you're soldering like, like this is actually really, really clean because you end up like to, in order to get good power transfer between the power card and, and the and the GPU, like you need to pick um, places where you have, you know, where the PCB is actually designed to handle a lot of current. So like technically speaking, because basically you have to uh, count for the current going from the VRM to the core, and then also all of that current has to make it back to the VRM, right? Like, that all has to go back to the e-power. The e and so the thing is, is, like, technically, you could try to return some of the current through, like, screw holes, because screw holes are technically ground. However, screw holes are not designed to deliver power. That's not what they're for. And so if you try to ground an e-power through, like, screw holes, a lot of the time it doesn't work. Um, also a lot of the, like, like, so a lot of what goes into doing a good e-power mod is just figuring out where you're going to attach everything. Um, admittedly, it's a lot easier to deal, like, set this up when you're only planning to run one card and your e-power is at basically a 90 degree angle to the PCB. Um, because the thing is, most GPU VRMs, the way they're laid out, is actually your best ground connection is going to be behind the actual v output of the VRM because that's where all the low side MOSFETs go because the stock VRM configuration, obviously, has to deal with the same thing. Current comes out of the inductors, goes to the cores, and then has to return to the low side MOSFETs. So that's what we can see here with the... Uh, where is it? In this picture. Like, you can see this is actually pulling... Like, this is the, the return for the car... Like, this is the ground connection for the uh, for the e power, and that's actually relying on the uh, ground connections of the low side MOSFETs that this VRM would have, because like the low side MOSFETs have to be you know well connected to the ground of the of the PCB in order to function properly. Um, Whereas, you know, you might be tempted to like, oh, let's ground off of a screw hole like that, which is very easy and convenient to do, but there's like the, it's not designed to actually handle that much current, and so then you end up with massive amounts of power loss between the the, the power card and, and the GPU. Um, so yeah, these are very, very sort of, like, on paper it sounds super simple, because it's like, oh, you just replace the VRM and then you run power and ground wires, and then... And in practice, it gets very, very complicated because it turns out where exactly you choose to connect your ground and where exactly you choose to connect your V-Core, how you connect it, um, makes huge differences to, you know, how well this modification works. And then, of course, you also have to convince the card that everything is fine and it, you know, yeah, it's turn on, damn it. <laughs> um that's that's always the the that that's another fun part of e-powers is just like getting the card to turn on again after you've done all of these modifications. And we've also got some cap mods hanging out uh, on the board, which is probably just to account for the fact that I think they pulled off a bunch of yeah. It looks well. I'm not sure if those go those those got removed or if they weren't there in the first place, but you know, ex like extra capacitance on the on the card doesn't hurt because the thing is. Um, yes, the e-power itself has a ton of capacitors on it, but you don't know how effective those are going to be with, you know, the solder, like, with the connection that they have to the, to the card. Because that's going to have some amount of impedance, and that's going to make all of the capacitors on the e-power, like, on the e-power itself significantly less effective at uh, filtering the power. Like, because the, the thing is, like, we don't actually necessarily care that much about voltage, re like the the voltage being unstable at the at the power card end the concern is what the core is getting right so all of these capacitors right here um aren't necessarily going to be that helpful to the core which is you know relatively far away so yeah awesome for, awesome score here from shaggy svk and 3d mark 03 uh with the 1060 so congratulations to him on that and uh Let's move on to his next score, which is a GTX 780 on LN2. No crazy e-power this time, but this card had a dead memory chip. 
And I figured, you know, like that that's cool. Um when when you run a card that literally like got repaired. Um so yeah, re replace the dead memory chip and first thing you do with it, run it on liquid nitrogen. Um which uh there's a significant lack of LN2 pot in this picture. Very concerning. I <laughs> Anyway, card managed to go 1855 on the core, 15 and 1502 on the memory, uh, GTX 780. They were just running GPU Pi. Actually, memory's running at stock because this is GPU Pi. GPU Pi is an interesting benchmark. It's a compute benchmark uh, using CUDA or OpenCL on AMD GPUs or OpenCL on CPUs. Um, and the interesting thing about it is, is it doesn't run very hot. Um, because being a compute benchmark, it doesn't actually take advantage of all the resources on the card. Also, fun fact about the uh, classified GPUs from EVGA, the, there's a really cool voltage utility, like voltage control utility for them that's just super convenient and awesome, which is what this is, the GTX classified controller. Imagine if all GPUs came with something like that, it would be amazing. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, NVIDIA would probably blow a fuse if manufacturers started handing out tools like that. Um, and stop giving anybody cards, and the only thing you could buy is a Founder's Edition. <laughs> anyway, like, EVGA somehow manages to get away with producing utilities like this, whereas, like, other board partners, like, yeah. Anyway, um, admittedly, I think back in the day of the GTX 7 780, it wasn't quite so locked down. But yeah, so the thing with GPU Pi <coughs> is being a compute benchmark, it doesn't really hammer the whole GPU, it runs very cool, and you can run insane clocks in it as a result of that. So that that's a big part of like 1855, and I believe this was just pre-testing. Like they don't even have the card insulated, so this really looks like just a, a test run to see, hey, does this thing actually work after we swap the memory chip? And it's like the answer is yes, and it works great because this is a third place, uh, you know, third place score in the GTX 780 GPU Pi 1 billion rankings. So I'm excited to see what this card will be doing when they like fully prep it for LN2 and take it for a spin in something like Firestrike, the greatest benchmark ever made. <laughs> or 3D Mark 11, Vantage, you know, tons of options. Also, actually, I think they were probably running GPU Pi because they didn't have a proper 3D motherboard set up. Like, what is that thing? That is not a Maximus 9 Apex. That does, wait a minute. Oh, wait. Uh, no, they don't have a motherboard window open. So maybe it was on a Maximus 9 Apex. Still not exactly a mo Well, that's with the 9900... Oh, that's a modded Apex. Um, yeah, but you wouldn't really want to run Vantage on that. Or Firestrike. Or 11. Yeah, like, all of, all of the benchmarks I listed off, they all need, like, at least a 16-core CPU, and that 9900K is very much not a 16-core so it makes sense that they only ended up running GPU Pi, um, and I guess they didn't really want to want to like prep the 9900K for LN2 because actually, if you wanted to run like say GTX 780 and 3D Mark 3, well, you should do that with an 11900K, right? <laughs> Which they had. So yeah, this was very much a pre-testing score, but still really cool that you know fix the card and immediately get a top top three score on LN2 with it in GPU Pi. So congratulations to Shaggy SVK on, well, I guess both the modifications and the repair, um, as well as the scores. And let's move on to the next score, which is CB, uh, is it CB Joust or CBJ Oust? I have no idea. Either way, um, a very solid score in 3D Mark Firestrike with the R9390X on just air cooling. And the crazy thing is, like, that's 1250 core. So that thing is moving. Like, Hawaii cards doing over 1200 is quite difficult, is, is the way I'm going to put it. Like, a lot of these cars, like, a lot of Hawaii cores will not go over 1200, especially not on air cooling. Um, so, yeah, this, this is a quite a, an impressive run in that just 1250 core on the, on the third, uh, on the 390, uh, on the 390X, and then 1675 on the memory, which is roughly what you'd expect. Um, I don't believe you could get a 390 with, uh, with, uh, Alpida memory, which, that, that, like, you can get 290s and 290Xs with Alpida memory, and when you get one of those, it's just, it's a, it's a very sad day. 
because <laughs> Elpida V Ram sucks so much on those cards. Uh, not a real, not something you can run into with 390Xs as far as I know, so that's great. Um, and then we have a 3900X here doing 4.4 gigahertz um, on a B550 Unify X, just 1800, 14, 14, 14 on the memory. Um, really chill on the memory settings. I, I would have pushed the memory a bit harder. Like, Firestrike doesn't care the most about memory settings, but it cares a little bit. At least with the 5000 series CPUs it does. I'm not sure if with 3000 series it cares quite as much. Um, but yeah, uh, like, you know, you're on a Unify X. Like, run 1900 Infinity Fabric, come on. <laughs> but still, a very, very solid score in the, the, the 390X rankings. Um, because... Yeah, literally the top score, right? For first place. Um, on, I guess, technically stock cooling, because that is the, the heatsink that it comes with. But, I mean, technically speaking, you can get th 390Xs that were designed for OEMs with a blower heatsink. Like, you, you wouldn't be doing 1250 on that. Not, not even close. Because at 1250 core... Do we have a voltage readout? Oh, it's a shame we don't have a voltage readout. But... Like, it is very, very easy to have a 390X or a 290X or really any of the Hawaii cards pulling well over 400 watts. Very, very easy to do that. Um, and so they get really hot. Um, so, yeah, a very, very solid score here from from CBJ Oust. Uh, CB Joust. I'm going to go with CB Joust. Um, from, so from CB Joust here on the, on the 390X, and, uh, yeah, and this is a ranking, I think, you know, it, that, that could, like, like, I don't have a 390X, but this is a ranking that I'm surprised there's not, well, I had a 390X, it up and died. <laughs> Unfortunately, these really big power-hungry cards have a tendency to just randomly die. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, like, th this is a ranking I'm surprised there's not more competition in. Um... Then again, I guess the 390 was the far more popular card of the 390X and the and, and the 390. Um, but the thing is, like, Hawaii cards are just so fun to mess with because they scale with voltage. Um, they do pull an insane amount of power, but they scale with voltage. They scale great with cooling. Like, just going from air cooling to water cooling, um, you know, well... When I say great, like, they scale enough that you're going to notice. So you're going to be able to actually run, like, say, on a card that will only do, like, 1,200 on air cooling. Uh, with water cooling, you, you can easily do 1,250. So a card like this, this might be, like, a 1,300 card. And the thing is, when I say water cooling, I mean, like, you could zip tie an AIO to one of these. And it makes a noticeable difference to the kinds of clocks you can hit. Uh, also, you can mod the memory timings on them. Uh, which, of course, is always great fun. And, uh, yeah, like, Hawaii, like, old AMD GPUs are my favorite GPUs. And it's not just because they were relevant when I first got into PC building. <laughs> Though it might be. It might actually be just a nostalgia thing with me and my, my love of, like, early GCN designs. Well, the thing, I actually like Polaris as well. Because Polaris doesn't really change anything compared to the old GCN designs. Uh, or it doesn't change much compared to the old GCN designs. And it's the same thing. It scales with voltage, um, scales with cooling, has memory... You can mod the memory timings. You can mess with the BIOS modding a lot. Um, yeah. So Hawaii, like Tahiti, like all of the... All of the... Everything except like Fiji and Vega is is, is great fun on GCN. Um, and then Fiji and Vega are like something like... Well, Fiji doesn't let you overclock the HBM, and I'm not going to... I'm not going to stop complaining about that. Probably ever. <laughs> and uh, Vega is, well, it's Vega. <laughs> so, you know. I, I don't think any... That, I don't think Vega needs any explaining. So anyway, congratulations to CB Joust on the uh, first place in 3D Mark Firestrike using a 390X. And let's move on to the next score. Which is Exaberry's 3D Mark Vantage Performance on triple GTX 570s. I love big multi-GPU setups, and it doesn't get much, like, well, actually, these days it would actually get much bigger. Like, eh, I'd say three 390Xs or three 290Xs would be much bigger. But, you know, as far as big multi-GPU setups go, three Fermi cards is up there. Um, and we've got a power reading to match. 
That's um, 1,100, yeah, 1,158 watts from the wall, 6950X. This is actually a well-balanced 3D Mark Vantage. It's not like the, the 6950X is carrying the cards super hard. Um, all right, Rampage 5 Extreme Motherboard. I am not going to share my thoughts on that mother... Actually, no, I will share my mo thoughts on my motherboard. That motherboard is responsible for me not being an Asus fanboy anymore. Uh, and that's that's all I'll say about it. Like, I don't know if it was better with Broadwell E, but with Haswell E, man, this board is the number one, top ten reason. Like, number one reason I'm no longer an Asus fanboy is the Rampage Five Extreme. Because I was, I loved the Rampage Four Extreme, and I had a bunch of like AM3 Plus Asus boards. I really liked those, and then I then eventually I got a Rampage Five Extreme. And uh, that that's when I figured out, you know what? Maybe I should buy other brands. <laughs> Sometimes. Not always, just for some, like, the, the thing is, I feel like every motherboard vendor has their ups and downs with certain platforms, and yeah. Um, for The X99 with Asus, I'd say, is definitely a down. <laughs> but still, uh, Broadwell E is a interesting, um, or, well, interesting, 60, like, well, I, I don't know. Broadwell E is weird. Because it clocks worse than Haswell E, but it did, like, the 6950X did compensate for that by just having two more cores than the 5960X, so you don't lose out, right? Like, whereas, like, the 6900K is actually just a straight downgrade from a 5960X, because it clocks worse, it doesn't really have a lot more IPC, uh, you can't overclock the uncore on these chips properly, so on Haswell E, with certain motherboards, you could overclock the uncore a lot, uh, with Broadwell E, that doesn't work anymore. Um, I don't know why, but it just stopped working. Um, and then the memory overclocking on X99 is just in general a mess because the, it's the first DDR4 memory controllers. So, you know, everybody was just figuring things out. And the end result is that you, well, now we see people running, like back then we didn't have any memory chips that were as strong as Samsung BDI. But now that we have Samsung BDI, you know, you get to see scores where you have a 6950X doing 4.4 gigahertz with memory running 3200, 10, 10, 10, 20 for, for the timings, which is just like, uh, you don't see that any, like, you don't see that on, on anything else because on any other platform, you can actually run proper frequency. But on X99, those memory controllers, they hate clocks, like high clocks so much that you, a lot of the time you end up running something like 3200 CL10, just because running 3400 CL12 is borderline impossible with some CPUs. Uh, and then also it depends uh, heavily on the motherboard that you're running as well. And so that makes these CPUs very, very, uh, well, interesting. It is certainly a unique platform. It's got great compatibility with GPUs though. Like, a lot of more modern Intel platforms, there's a lot of GPUs that you'll plug in and they won't even turn on. Like, the, the motherboard will refuse to recognize the GPU. X99, I've not run into that. I, I don't think there's any GPU that... Like, any PCIe uh, GPU should run on X99, based on my experience. Whereas with, like, anything newer than X99, it's like, if it's got a PLX chip, there's a decent chance it won't run. Well, not a PLX chip. If it has the NVIDIA PCIe switch decent chance it won't run. So like GTX 590s are a great example of that. Anyway, um, GTX 5, like three GTX 570s running 900 megahertz on the core, uh, 1017 on the memory, uh, which uh, I, I, I've benched a bit of Fermi, not a lot of Fermi. Um, I'm surprised he didn't max, actually no, I'm not surprised he didn't max the voltage slider because um, it looks like this is a multi-PSU setup. <laughs> That look that really looks like I'm I'm basing that off of the fact that he has that jumper over there. So it looks like what that 650 watt power supply is powering something in this mess. And I'm guessing there's another power supply handling the actual cards. Or why is this running? Like this do we have details about this being multi? No, nah, it's gotta be multi. Yeah, using a CX650. Okay, I have, uh, wait, VBIOS modded for 100% span, fan speed and more voltage range, but you're not using it. At least not in the screenshot you aren't. Like, why aren't these at 1.2 volts? I, I think at 1.2 volts they would shut down the power, like it would shut down the power supplies, but... Anyway, um, yeah, this Fermi pulls a lot of power. 
Um, so this looks like a fun thing to run if you actually have, like, well, I mean, the, the fun in a sketchy kind of way. <laughs> This is fun sketchy. Yeah, this is fun sketchy with with the two power supplies. One of which is a questionable choice for doing something like this. I guess if it's handling just one of the GP. Actually, could it be? Ha is the eight the A fifty should be enough for just the sixty nine fifty X and the two five seventies. So yeah, the six fifty is probably just handling one of the GPUs, and for that, it should be enough. Uh, for extra PCIe slot power. Um, I w the way that is normally wired, you would be feeding 12 volt from one power supply into the other through the board, which actually might work out okay, because, like, uh, yeah, that might work out okay, I guess. Um, but generally, if you're doing multi-PSU, you want, like, you don't... Like, the, the thing is, the extra PCIe slot power on a motherboard is normally just, like, that's that, that connector is connected to the same 12-volt power plane as the 24-pin. And there's... There might be some motherboards that have a switch between the two, where it's like, if you're not using the auxiliary power, it, it doesn't... It, it disconnects it from the 24-pin. Or, like, it, it... like Yeah, if you're using the auxiliary power, it disconnects the 24-pin the from it, but... I'm not sure that the Rampage 5 Extreme does that. And there's a lot of motherboards that definitely don't do that. And so that is, uh, like, that's not the best idea, in my opinion. Just, pl well, I, I guess if you check first, then, you know, you, you can be sure about that. Um, yeah, so this, like, th this is just an awesome score with a uh, uh, awesome setup. Also, the 100% fan speed. I, I pity the, uh, this, this uh, I, I pity Exaberry's ears. Um, because those are blowers, <laughs> and there's three of them, uh, which probably explains the clock speeds, because in my, like, for Fermi, well, also it's three cards, so there's, like, the thing is, with triple GPU setups, right, you have, like, the each, like, the cards start getting starred for, for airflow, because, like, blower fans are pretty good in terms of air pressure, like, in terms of dealing with airflow restrictions, but, like, this, this it's still an airflow restriction, and you're not going to be... Like, I'm not sure how it works. Like, at 100% fan speed, this might be enough to overcome the, the airflow restriction. But, man, this is going to be so loud. And also, the thing is, it's a blower heatsink. And blower heatsinks just kind of suck at cooling at the best of times. Like, if you have a blower heatsink at 100% fan speed without any airflow restrictions, it's still terrible. Um, so, with airflow restrictions, it's kind of like, oh, man, this... The, yeah, the, like, the, the decent chance that the clock speeds here are just, like, thermally limited, because, um, yeah, unfortunately, like, Fermi's one of those architectures where it's, like, it, if you raise the volt, like, it very early hits the point of being too hot to benefit from extra voltage. Um, so, yeah, but still, just an awesome, awesome setup and, and, and an awesome score, because first place in the GTX 570 triple triple GP like triple GTX 570 rankings for 3D Mark Vantage performance so congratulations to Exaberries on on that and uh yeah um I hope he had earplugs for this cuz man that 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 looks so unpleasant to be near um or I guess you could start the benchmark and go to another room you know just just don't stay near the system <laughs> Um, or I guess you could run the monitor, like, monitor out some to another, like, monitor and keyboard to another room, so you don't have to, have to stand near this thing when it's running. Anyway, let's move on to the last score, which is Plasma Car Carrots Unigen Heaven Extreme on dual GT GeForce GTS 450s, so more for me, but much, much smaller. I think these are for me, right? These are, yeah, JF106, um, so more for me, but much, much smaller for me. So higher clocks, because this, generally with GPUs, the smaller the core, the higher, like, actually, it's almost universal. Um, the less cores you have, the fat, higher, higher it clocks, right? And smaller GPU cores have less cores in them, so they clock higher. 960 megahertz core, 1050 on the memory. Um, and then 9, 1920, I'm not, I'm surprised that, oh, I guess the memory really sucked. Does he not have memory voltage mods? Or I guess he only has a core voltage. Wait, no, I'm I'm seeing two potentiometers. Like, this this is in the roundup because we've got volt mods to look at, right? I everybody like, and this is this is 
you know, if, if you're going to start, like, if you want to learn how to vault vault, this is the kind of thing you should start on, in my opinion, is like GTS 450s, or really anything Fermi is a is a good starting point. A lot, unfortunately, a lot of Fermi cards won't scale that far on like air cooling. Um, you really do need to get them cold in order to. But you know, like the I guess next step, just get yourself some dry ice. You know, uh, or yeah, actually, you can you can do sorted chilled water cooling using dry ice or an ice bucket, right? Um, plenty of options, and with with cards like this, very low risk, right? Because like GTS four fifties. Perf like perfect test subjects really perfect test subject cards um and anyway um plasma plasma carrot here uh running and also like the cool thing with uh, something like a gts 450 in a in a benchmark like unigen heaven is that it's so bottlenecked by the like the, it's so gpu bottlenecked that you don't have to worry about like going up against 11 900 k's or something because this is unigen heaven it's it's come like for a thousand three hundred sixteen points, I think you could get away with an FX CPU and still get like a decent score in this ranking. Now here we have a four seven ninety K that's absolutely flying at five point one gigahertz, uh, you know, on all core, all four cores and eight threads. But yeah, Unigen Heaven at like this kind of this kind of score, you really shouldn't need much CPU performance whatsoever. A 4790K should be good for up to like 6,000 points at 5.1. Yeah, at 5.1 gigahertz, I'd expect the, uh, a 4790K to be good up to like 6,000-ish points. Or maybe mid-5,000s? Um, something like that. Um, so you don't need a super, super... Like, this is a properly... Like, this is like with the GTS 450, this is a proper GPU benchmark. There's no CPU subtest. Um, and for the longest... Uh, this, is a, this is a benchmark that I really liked. Um, and then they removed global points from it. <laughs> I still really like it. I'm just salty that it doesn't have global points anymore. Um, and it's totally not, uh, you know, it's totally not because of that. <laughs> not, it's, it's not the reason why I'm annoyed. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so Unigen Heaven is just like, a great GPU benchmark, especially, like, and for older GPU point, like, older GPUs, you still get points for it, so, yeah, GTS 450s is a perfect example of that, and so, all around, this is just a, you know, like, actually, the memory is also, you know, pushed pretty hard, doing, what is that, DDR3 2888, um, on four gigs of memory, well, I wonder what memory sticks are those, those are some kind of, oh, I guess that's gonna be, oh, that might be XMP for those, um, yeah, because that's actually like an XMP for uh, LP to hyper-based Corsair Dominators. Um, yeah, that's that's probably that's probably what those sticks are. Um, but yeah, like we've got Vault mods, we've got multi GPU, we've got you know e everything I like to see. Uh, well, we no cr well actually we have pretty wacky coolers on there, right? That looks like a I don't know what that heatsink is. I don't think, like, this is a stock MSI heatsink, this one over here. But that one over there, I have no idea what that is. That's a cool heatsink. Anyway, so, yeah, awesome score here from Plasma Carrick in Unigen Heaven Extreme with two GTS 450s. And that's it for this roundup. Man, I keep making these longer. But, like, these scores are cool. I think I'm going to have to reimpose a score limit, like score count limit. <laughs> Cuz currently it's like if there's a week where a lot of people post like cool GPU benchmarks, I'm just going to be like like it's just not going to end. <laughs> um anyway, so I guess yeah, that's that's it for this this week's roundup. Um you know, like some really awesome hardware scores, right? Between Literally the X58 BCLK frequency record, quad core Geekbench record going down. Um, and then just so many strong GPU scores. Just so many of them. Um, yeah. And I, unfortunately. 
And maybe I should just cut back on how much I talk about each score. Because there's not actually that many scores here, is there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Yeah, that's not that many scores. I need to learn to shut up. <laughs> that's what I need to do. Um... Because, yeah, this this is an hour and 30 minutes, and I, I do apologize for that, I guess. But, uh, um, yeah, in the future, I'll try to... Like, the issue is, I don't have a plan for these, right? It's just kind of like looking at, at cool scores and sharing my thoughts, and I have a lot of thoughts. So, anyway, I'll just, I'll just end the video. So, thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking... Uh, I have a Patreon. There's a link down in the description below. There's also the AHOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, you know, the, the usual YouTuber merch. Both Patreon and Teespring help out immensely with running the channel, so it would be much appreciated if you'd check them out. And that is it for the video, so thank you for watching, and goodbye.